Well, good afternoon. Being the last speaker in this session, um, I still want to thank the organizers, and I want to especially thank Paul Denis and Kai Sunahara for generously giving me um, access to the material that I want to present today. And I'm studying this since a couple of years, and I'm staying here for six weeks, I think, still. And it's very, very generous from them to help me and to support my research. I have the big challenge to switch now from the gene to Cyprus. And originally, this was supposed to be done by Lindy Crew. And then I have the second challenge to change from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. So we'll see how I manage. The, the lecture by Lindy Crew was supposed to present anthropomorphic blank figures in Cyprus, particularly during the early Bronze Age. In the late Bronze Age, the significance of Cyprus grows even further with the emergence of large city structures. Due to its rich mineral resources, especially the copper deposits, Cyprus is on par with the other advanced civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Hittites, ancient Syria, and ancient Egypt. The term Alasha appears for Cyprus in the so-called Amana letters, but it remains unclear whether this term refers to the entire island or only to a specific kingdom settled here. This question is not important for us in this context, but we will come back to the late Bronze Age name of Alasha later. My lecture focuses on a sanctuary site in Cyprus that was excavated in the late 19th century and most of its discoveries have made their way to Toronto. The most important pieces are exhibited in the A.G. Leventis Gallery of Ancient Cyprus here on level 3. The finds of Frangisa are something very special, not only for the rum, but also for the international, international museum landscape outside Cyprus itself. It is true that the Cyprus collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, assembled by Chesnola, is undoubtedly larger and has many pieces that are superior to the Rome collection in terms of preservation and aesthetics. But, and this applies to most international collections, these pieces generally have no real context. They were mostly acquired in the late 19th century from the art market, and nothing is known about the exact circumstances of their discovery. Rarely is the excavation site documented, and when it is, it's often not more than a place name. In the case of the unique material from Frangisa, it's different. Here we can trace the beginning of scientific engagement with ancient Cyprus through the activities of the German archaeologist Max Ohnefalsch Richter. Of course, his methods and documentation are far from what is considered standard today, but it's no longer pure treasure hunting as practiced by Cesnola and other diplomats operating in Cyprus yet before. So let's go back to Cyprus in the year 1885. The island has only been under British rule for seven years, Previously, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, and interestingly, some of the old Ottoman laws still apply under the British. This includes the regulation that, in archaeological excavations, only a third of the finds must be surrendered to the government, while the rest is divided between the excavator and the landowner, who often was paid out in advance. This allowed the excavator to legally keep two-thirds of the finds and also to export them outside, out of the country. So archaeological excavations were usually considered as business idea and investment. Of course, the excavator was considered the one who paid for the excavation, not the scientist who led the excavation. And in our case, it wasn't only Falsch Richter, but the British colonial officer Colonel Falkland Warren working in the island administration. After leaving Cyprus in 1819, um, 18, no, 1890, 
Warren subsequently migrated to Canada to work for the Canadian Pacific Railway. In a deal that financed his and his family move, at least 350 objects of his separate collection were donated to the Canadian people and handed over to the National Art Gallery in Ottawa, much later transferred to the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. The export of these antiquities is therefore completely unobjectionable and, according to the understanding of the time, legal. The Rome has no claims for restitution to expect, as the British Museum does for the Elgin marbles or the British Museum for the Nefertiti boost. Indeed, Cyprus cultural policy views these pieces as ambassadors. And that works very well. Look, today we are dis discussing them and this small island in the eastern Mediterranean. Back to the excavation. The whole story is owned to an incredible coincidence. Unifarch Richter, working for Falkland Warren, excavated in Tamasos, the capital of an inland kingdom located about 25 kilometers southeast of the present day capital Nicosia. Ancient Tamasos owned its immense wealth to copper mining and is even mentioned for that in the Bible. Since the early 19th century, the site has been known for its rich archaeological finds. For example, the world famous Chetworth hat, now in the British Museum, comes from here. However, the excavations of 1885 were initially not very successful because no sensational finds were made. Excavations took place in the settlement area of the ancient city and only walls and shirts, but nothing that could be solved could be sold at high profit. In the graves of the nearby necropolises, built in the shape of underground stone chambers, plenty of intact vessels were found, at least. Just before the onset of winter, a shepherd approached Onefart Richter and reported seeing sculpture fragments in the stream bed in a remote valley about five kilometers from the city. A visit to the site convinced Onefarsch Richter that he had found a significant and completely undisturbed sanctuary and faced with the impending rainy season, he immediately began the excavations. The finds quickly made it clear that this was a place where the ancient people of Tamasos sacrificed to and worshipped the gods. Votive gifts in the form of statues depicting the votaries themselves were found in abundance. Over 500 figures, many life-sized, and some even of colossal size exceeding three and a half meters in height, made of limestone and terracotta, were recovered. They indicate the sanctuary was in use for a long time, as the earliest votives date back to the seventh century BC, and the latest ones to the second and first uh, century BC. The place was in use for over uh, for more than half a millennium. People prayed here, sacrificed small animals such as doves or goats, burned incense, and all of this is depicted in the images. People appeared before their god in festive long clothing and wore a wreath of leaves on their heads, especially from the fifth century BC onwards. In earlier times, a more Warlike aspect was emphasized, and so, in addition to helmets as headdress, there are also depictions of small chariots and equestrian figures. Who this sanctuary was dedicated to became clear through the, through the discovery of three inscriptions that mention the name of the god Apollo. Two of these inscriptions are bilingual, and in the Phoenician written text, the god is mentioned as Reshef. In one of these inscriptions, Apollo is also referred with the epithet Alasiotas. Some scholars have seen this as an adoption of the Bronze Age name of Cyprus, Alasia, and assume that we can grasp direct cult continuity since the late Bronze Age. Otherwise, the name Alasia is completely unknown in the first millennium BC. Since his budget was nearly exhausted, Unfall Richter had to limit his work and therefore only excavated the open wall 
the open walled courtyard where the votive gifts are said to have been displayed. However, trial trenches around the area convinced him that further parts of the sanctuary were still underground, which he did not excavate due to time constraints. Beside the published plan, we have a commented drawing by Unifat Richter and a small sketch in a letter from Falkland Warren, which includes these test trenches and shows that the area must have been significantly larger than the excavated courtyard. As the landowner, a winemaker from the neighboring village, wanted to continue using the land, it was agreed by contract to backfill the area after the two weeks of excavation. Consequently, with nothing visible above ground, the exact location of the place gradually faded from memory over the decades. Even the German excavations in the urban center of Tamasos, conducted under the direction of Hans Günther Buchholz between 1970 and 1980, could not rediscover the site of the ex-urban sanctuary despite intensive searching. However, Buchholz managed to identify the forgotten Canadian material, which had been transferred from Ottawa to Toronto in the meanwhile, using eight historical photographs taken of the finds before the division took place in 1886. These photographs are therefore of the greatest value because the part of the find material that stayed in Cyprus was also considered largely lost, and not all objects from Warren's share have survived. I can trace, I can trace now about 400 out of the original over 500 objects, so, Ryan, so around 20% are still missing, and I'm still searching for them in um, the international museums worldwide. These slides gives you an impression of the pieces identified so far. Looking at the material as a whole, it consists of a few complete statues, but mainly of heads of figures. Here in Toronto, for example, we have 150 heads of limestone statues, but only about 50 bodies. During my last stay here in Toronto, I was able to connect 10 headless torsos with their corresponding heads. However, the imbalance remains and there is a suspicion that not all finds were collected during the excavations. Indeed, there are remarks by Onifat Richter indicating that the non-valuable items were sorted out. Added to this fact is that numerous statue bases are marked on the published plan, but not a single one is stored in the museums. They have therefore obviously remained on site. These two considerations made a re-examination of the find spot seem highly worthwhile. A first survey in 2020 with a team from the University of Frankfurt was promising as we found a strong concentration of fragments of statues and terracottas on the surface in a specific part of the valley southeast of Damasos. Concentration. Um, in 2021, we started excavations with revealed ancient vaults, but it did not align with the known plan. So we could not be sure we were working in the right place. In 2022, we achieved the first match of finds to those of 1885, giving us certainty that we were in the right place. And in 2023, we finally uncovered a part of the known area recognizable on the published plan, revealing numerous statue bases that have stayed on site. You see here this remarkable base with these protruding parts, which we found here. And this is this diagonal wall, which you can see here. This unique, uniquely, uniquely shaped base uh, is of particular importance, um, standing in the entrance area of the Temenos. Directly in front of it, here, we found numerous fragments of statues, and it's very likely that these are pieces that Ohne Falschrichter classified as not worthwhile to keep. <coughs> here you see some of them. 
um, here you see a torso with two arms, uh, feet, and another statue. All these pieces are uh, fragments of statues. This immediately led to the next project I'm currently working on. We find numerous statues and fragments of votive offerings during our excavations, which may match the findings in Toronto and Nicosia. I'm showing you a selection of the newly discovered archaic statues, and you can see that they mainly consist of flat, board-like bodies without heads. The heads corresponding to this type of statue are abundant in Toronto. Since physical adjustment of, course, uh, of artifacts is challenging due to the considerable space um, distance and bureaucratic obstacles, I came up with the idea to digitally scan all the objects in and create 3D models. This applies not only to the new findings from my excavation, but also to the artifacts from the 1885 excavation. Hopefully, this will allow us to virtually unite the old and the new findings. I started with the scanning just last week, a lengthy and laborious process that requires extensive post-processing. As I'm currently focusing on data acquisition due to time constraints and not on evaluation, I cannot present any adjustments yet. However, since our excavation project will continue for at least three other years, we hope to discover more finds. This effort is crucial from a long-term perspective. In the last part of my presentation, I want to show you the potential of this material and the excavation site. I must emphasize that our current knowledge of Cypriot sanctuaries highly depends on the research conducted in the 19th century. Unlike in Greece, with its huge marble temples, we generally have no way to verify old plans and layouts. All these sanctuaries from the archaic and classical periods have been either backfilled or are so badly destroyed that it's extremely difficult to check them at present. Therefore, projects like our excavation in Tamasos Frangisa or the excavations of my Berlin colleague Stefan Schmidt in the neighboring Idalion are crucial as they allow us to control and revision the old plans. There are several minor corrections concerning the course of walls and their thickness. However, more crucial insights are possible through these new excavations. I want to explain this uh, with an example. The excavations of the Apollo Sanctuary in Idalion in 1869 brought numerous artifacts to light including several statues now housed in the British Museum. This material was published in 1993 by Reinhard Senf, who also built a model of the sanctuary. This model has become influential and it's depicted in every handbook on Cypriot religion. However, looking at its foundation, you see that while the bases are marked on the plan, You see the, the, the basis, they are marked on the plan, but the architecture that uh, was used, was reconstructed here, that's uh, purely invented. Moreover, the model does not consider the original terrain structure, which was naturally not captured in the length two-dimensional plan. So let's return to the sanctuary in Frangisa, where the plan also shows a dense sequence of statue bases, especially here. I have long wondered how the original arrangement might have been. Erecting a statue primarily documents a connection between the donor and the deity. But it also serves the purpose of prominently presenting the donor to other visitors of the sanctuary. For this self-representation, it is necessary that the statue is visible or not obstructed. During our excavation last year, we uncovered pre precisely this area where the dense concentration of statue bases is visible alongside the exterior wall of this small chapel-like structure inside the open courtyard. The chapel itself is not preserved because Ona Fasrichte had the rising masonry torn down in search, of, in search of inscriptions and all we can find is the rubble. 
However, what is at least partially preserved is the area where the statue bases stood. And here is something that in this form was so far unknown in any sanctuary in Cyprus and can now be observed for the first time. The bases do not stand, as the printed plan suggests, on one flat level behind each other, but they are staggered and form ascending steps against the slope. This ensures that all figures can be seen from below by the viewers. Something like that has never been observed, and it has indeed been almost prophetic that when the Leventis Gallery of the Rome was set up a few years ago, Paul Denis designed the largest showcase to display precisely such a stepped structure. I know that he was inspired by the old photo of Falkland Warren depicting the finds, but it does capture the ancient situation very well. It's not only about storing votive offerings protected from the weather by a roof, but all about confidently presenting them to visitors arriving from near and far, like in a museum. Our last excavation campaign confirmed Ohne Falschrichters in a second point. The sanctuary was significantly larger than just the area of the known open courtyard. Towards the northwest, a second building was attached, which has several construction phases. We can assume, based on the ceramic findings dating to the late Hellenistic period, a peristyle-like courtyard, at least in the latest phase of use. It was surrounded on all four sides by halls, providing pilgrims with shade and protection from rains. The ceramics found here are almost exclusively banquet ware. So this area was used for eating and celebrating in honor of the god. What we do not find in this area at all are votive offerings. Thus, the sanctuary shows a clear functional separation and distinction of individual areas, and it will be very interesting to deepen these observations in the coming years. With the processing of the votive statues located here in the Rom and at other sites, we will hopefully have the opportunity to assign individual statues to their respective bases, and thus reconstruct the sequence of their placement. However, there are also indications that the arrangement documented by Unifash Richter is not naturally grown, um, but an artificial staged arrangement where old material and new pieces were presented side by side, like in a museum. Recent investigations on the material of other sanctuaries in Cyprus also support this. Thus it becomes clear that we are still far from a comprehensive understanding of Cypriot cult practices and many questions remain open. A further research in Cyprus, but also here at the Rome, will therefore remain exciting. Thank you very much. <laughs>